Hey, and welcome everybody to our uh, series on um, marriage counseling, the family from a Bowen Family Systems perspective. I have with me today again, Kelly Matthews, uh, based out of Chicago, licensed clinical social worker who works a lot with parents, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, uh, is parenting and, and uh, different ways to think about um, parenting. There's a lot of conventional advice out there about what is right to do as a parent in Bowen Family systems theory has a pretty different perspective uh, that I think is just incredibly helpful. I know I would not have made it, and maybe my kids wouldn't have either if I didn't have this very different perspective. <laughs> uh, so we're going to be digging into that today. I'm Miriam Bellamy, licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and there you go. Our contact information will be uh, on this blog post as well. So uh, we're talking about parenting today, Kelly. Um, where do you want to start? <laughs> well, I think that um, you and I were speaking earlier about triangles. That's, that's a, a major piece, I think, in parenting uh, focus or, or child focus, as, as the theory calls it. Um, and so maybe it would be helpful to talk about triangles in a very um, general, brief way. And then we could sort of pull in how that works uh, in a family with, with parents focusing on a child. Yeah, that's a good idea. We, we have been sort of talking about triangles in these last few, uh, in our, in this series. And I was saying to you that, uh, you know, I've studied triangles for years and I, it's still becoming something that I understand. <laughs> Do you remember those, pick those posters from, I think it was in the eighties where you'd stare, it just looked like a bunch of colored dots. Oh and yeah. Stared at them or if you got just in the right angle, this whole picture would come forward, you know? Oh. So sure. me, that's what like understanding triangles is. It's like, it just, it's a triangle. It's just a shape on a page. And then wait a minute. Oh, that's, a, oh, it's impacting my marriage. Oh, it's impacting the decisions I make moment by moment with my children. Oh, right. the triangle I have with my parents is impacting this. I mean, it just becomes, and then it also, you know, is helpful in understanding. So what do I do? <laughs> right. How do I handle a particular painful or emotional situation? So yeah, so yeah let's talk. Yeah, you said generally about triangles. How would you yeah. define a triangle? And yeah, sure. we'll just go from there. Sure. Um, I talk about triangles and sometimes I'll write, oftentimes I'll write it on a board, a whiteboard for, for, for clients just because that's an easy way to think of it. But if people could think of, you know, the three points of the triangle being three different people. And if you keep that in your mind, um, any connection in, in Bowen theory, the idea is to have as many one-to-one -one close connections that you can with those that are close to you. So family members in your nuclear family, your extended family, and then of course kind of out from that friends and coworkers, things like that. Um, and so the one-to-one -one connection is sort of um, uh, counter to a triangle, but all of us sort of participate in triangles from time to time or a lot, depending on, on where we're at with our, our information. Um, but the idea being that the information between two people and the relationship between two people goes back and forth between those two people until Tension rises, something happens, there's a conflict, there's distance on one part, of one person's part, um, something, something brews. If one person goes and talks to the third party, so the third point on the triangle, and then that person, uh, are you, you got me? Okay. And then no, that person, no, um, we lost you for a, a bit there, enough that I couldn't get it. So the last thing I heard clearly was, there's this one-to-one -one dynamic and yeah. it's just fine between two people unless, until stress comes in. Yeah. And then stress, what happens. Yeah. Stress and tension happens. And, and if the relationship is one in which people do not feel comfortable addressing that up front, the tension, the conflict, the distance, whatever it is, one or both of them, again, for this purpose, we'll just take one of them, goes and talks to the third point on the triangle, a third party that knows usually both of the people in the, in the other points of the triangle, mm -hmm. and, and sort of dis, dis, dishes about them, right? Gossips, okay. goes on and on about the issue, and they said this, and then they said this, and then they did this, and can you believe that? And the idea is, uh, I think we call this like blowing off steam, right? A lot of times, venting, um, which in and of itself isn't necessarily a bad idea. The, the downside... <laughs> <laughs> the downside is when we're going on and on with this third party, we're only getting temporary relief from the tension or the anxiety that we're feeling because this isn't the person we have the issue with. This is the person we have the issue with. And by, by addressing it this way and not going back and addressing it this way or even just starting from that point, um, 
and leaving the third party out, um, we're, not, we're not getting any resolution. There's not really going to be any, any, any resolution whatsoever. This tension is still there and present. It might die down as time goes on, but it will for sure just come up again in, in another conversation, another argument, another you know, stress point. So the idea and the theory is the less you do of this sort of going to this third party and the more you sort of stick with some of that uncomfortable feeling that is generated by this disconnect and this discomfort mm -hmm. and wait until you're ready to address it with that person unless you do it that way this is going to be just temporary relief and then you're right back at this later when it comes up again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so that's i think i think makes a lot of sense to people when people think of it again in those very theor theoretical terms they can start to understand how this happens in their family. This ha their dad or their mom talks to them about the other parent um, and maybe has for a long time since they were a teenager, since they were a child or since they were an adult mm -hmm. and how they might have a, something going on with their husband and they go talk to their girlfriend about it or they talk to their sister about it or they talk mm -hmm. to, you know, whomever, a friend. Um, and that we do this at work when things are tense with the person in the cube next to us and we don't want to talk to them about it. We don't want to bring it up. We're a little bit embarrassed. We're not sure how to say it. We don't want them to blow their top. We don't want to get overly emotional upset. All of those things. Yeah. Any, any and all. Then we go talk to somebody else. We go, you know, get a cup of coffee and we're talking and blah, blah, blah about the, this other person to a third party. And again, it's natural. Um, we see this in other animal species and other mammal species. It's a very natural, um, attempt to ease one's anxiety and stress. Uh, it's just not our, our best functioning, I think is how I put it. It's, it's normal, there's nothing pathological about it. It's just not our best. That's, mm -hmm. that's I think, important to know. Um, that, that, that doing this is not a bad thing. It's just not as functional as we could be. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that, that I think is important to understand. It's like, I think when this idea started becoming popular, people started, you're triangulating. It's like, well, yeah, I'm never not triangulating. <laughs> right. It's an adaptation that does reduce yep. tension and anxiety in the short term. Sure. Uh, sometimes for the long term, but usually you right. have to find other triangles to really dissipate. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then the triangles overlap, you know, with family members, right? Yeah. So I have an issue with my mom. I talked to my sister-in-law. Then, you know, my mom and my sister-in-law are not getting along. My sister-in-law sided with me. Then she might talk to another, and my brother, and then he's involved in it and has negative feelings towards my mom. You know, it just can go on and on and on and create, again, without anyone's plan that this should become this big complicated yeah. mess. In a family, it just happens. Um, just like so much of life, it just, you know, instincts take over and it just happens. But yeah, I think it's not, I don't think of it as dysfunction, right? I think of it as a yeah. way of functioning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it has its, um, it has its merits in mm -hmm. terms of reducing our anxiety. We feel a little bit better when we vent and we've gone on and on about somebody. We're like, Oh, well, that's good. Thank you. I feel so much better. Right. But mm -hmm. that's only a temporary fix. It's not just the issue with the other person yeah. where, where the, where the conflict originated. So, yeah. So, um, I want to talk to or start talking too about the more subtle ways I think a triangle can work um, because it's not always I'm frustrated with my husband so I go vent to my kids or so, so we're talking about parenting right yes yes how can you can, let's talk about the, that how the sort of the emotional intensity transfers because I think that's a big part of this too like I think of the a triangle as three circuits right yeah so the intensity here all of a sudden can start showing up over here, like with me and my son or daughter or something like that, right? Yeah. Yes. And I, you, you were sharing an example about, uh, what is the show? My Cat from Hell or something like that? Something like that. Yeah. yeah, something something like that. Um, it was on today here in Chicago, so I don't know when, you know, July 1st and uh, an early morning episode. I think they show these shows, you know, multiple times a day on the Animal Planet, but um, yeah. It was very interesting in that this, this young couple with a young baby, I think maybe an eight month old, mm -hmm. um, had, had a, also a cat prior to the baby being born. And the cat at some point got very aggressive and somehow clawed the, the baby. I think got, got a claw stuck actually in its forehead. They had to take it out. They sort of ran into the, 
bedroom, the cat was sort of at the door hissing every time they tried to open the door to get out. Um, the cat was right there being, being very aggressive. They had to call animal control. The cat got taken away. They wanted the cat back, so they had brought this guy in to sort of help them reintroduce uh, this cat back into the household. At the point he came in, the cat was in the bedroom by itself. They didn't really interact too much with the cat. They're pretty, pretty frightened of the cat for good reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the baby was fine, by the way. No, 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 I, a little <laughs> bump on his head, so he was okay. But, um, but one of the things when he, the, the cat expert kind of came in and sort of trying to assess this cat by himself in the room, he came up with this as a, an afraid cat, but a, a cat full of fear, but this is not a treacherous, vicious cat. Mm. Um, and so he, he was kind of stuck then. Well, how, how is that? Because what I heard from this other, this couple in the videos I saw, um, it was vicious, you know, just hissing and, and burying its teeth and, you know, very, very aggressive coming at them and that kind of thing. And he, it wasn't making sense to him. So he had the couple and the baby come back into the room and they all stood up while the cat was on the floor. And the cat's kind of, you know, going ca casually around, kind of rubbing against the legs and whatnot. And at one point, the mom got up, the cat got up on one of its little, I don't know, those things that they have, mm -hmm. that they sit on, perch or whatever it's called. And, and she's petting it and, and seems okay. And they're talking and he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm kind of confused. I think the cat's afraid. I don't think this is a vicious cat. I think we can work this out. Mm -hmm. And it, during that conversation, as they're filming it, the cat jumps, you know, leaps to the floor very casually, not at anything. Yeah brushes against the mother and she, you know, recoils and jerks, you know, very, very visibly. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the cat expert says, okay, see now what just happens, like mm -hmm. that's maybe what's happening is there's tension. You're feeling fear and tension, again, for good reason. Sure. That's getting transferred to the cat in just vibes, just emotional intensity in the room, just the, just the vibes in the room. And part of that then was your sort of body language, yeah. To the cat. So you're transmitting this emotionality that's pretty, pretty hot yeah. to this cat, you know, and that's, and then I had to go, so I didn't see the rest of it, but he was, he was pointing out the transfer of emotional intensity mm -hmm. between mammals in this household. Mm -hmm. um, very similar to how we can see that happen in parenting issues. Um, and that, that when you, you, you put out a term earlier, um, child focus, that is a term in Bowen theory. Yeah. And it's uh, another term for triangle, uh, was right. Bowen's right, original observations. And yeah. it's, it's basically Bowen's observation in the 1950s that, that we transmit emotional energy, whatever it is, to our kids and emotional intensity. And yeah. they transmit it back to us. And there's this yeah. kind of loop that goes on. Yep. Yep. This transfer. Yep. And that child focus specifically then being two parents, again, the tops of the triangle, uh -huh. two parents then focusing their energy on a kid. And mm -hmm. this could be a child who has behavioral issues. This could be a child who is not well physically, mm -hmm. has had you know, disabilities, is born that way, or develops an illness. Um, uh, this could be a child who's having social issues, making friends or not making friends, difficulty in that arena. Um, those are the three I'm thinking of, but, but any of those could happen. And uh, this could be emotional things happening in school, happening only at home. Yeah. Yeah, right. And then there's the child focus where the child is the superstar. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Can do no wrong. Yeah. And, you know, oftentimes we think of only children as being, you know, sort of built into a child-focused family because there's two adults yeah. and just one kid, you know, and um, sort of hard not to focus on the kid. Yeah. <laughs> not one of them. Um, but the idea being that the parents are not really addressing the conflict that might get stirred up between the two of them. And they just then don't, they don't focus necessarily that conflict on the kid but they will be distracted by the kids. Sometimes they'll do that. Sometimes they will focus their energies and be very, you know, rather immature about it and say, well, your dad said that I'm not a good mom or, you know, that might be directly yeah. what they say to the kid. But oftentimes I think most of the time it's much more subtle, mm -hmm. much more nuanced in that you have just tension here that is not getting addressed, mm -hmm. certainly not getting resolved. Yeah. And then they both can say, oh, I got to go get the kids or um, the kid, you know, has, makes a ruckus. And then the parents immediately divert toward, you know, toward that kid. I know Dan Pepper would always talk about, 
a case in which a toddler, I think a baby or a toddler had come into the session with the parents and the mom and dad are talking and the baby's on the floor playing and they're talking and it's getting rather heated with their mm -hmm. marital issues that Dan is talking to them about. Mm -hmm. And then the baby crawls, you know, toward an outlet in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, again, the baby doesn't know what they're doing necessarily, but they know that their parents are having a tense conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and then one of them has to get up and, you know, and, and attend to the baby. So I think those things can happen, again, in a myriad of ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's uh, sometimes challenging, I think, for people to, to see that. But again, if you study the triangles and you study the theory behind triangles, and, and then you start to think about the family you grew up in, um, the stories you got from your parents and the families they grew up in. Um, and then you start to think about your own parenting of your children. Mm -hmm. I think these things become very, very clear mm -hmm. um, and very, um, I think, insightful because most of what we talk about in Bone Theory would be not to tell people what to do, but for them to understand themselves better. All the points of the theory in my mind are about, can I understand this about my family? Not judge it, not criticize it, yeah. but understand it. Yeah. And then if I can understand it, you know, then I can do something about it. So I think triangles and child focus fall into that same category. If I can start to observe this in, in all the areas, or not all, but many of the areas in which triangles happen in my family mm -hmm. and in my life, at work and whatnot, you know, then I can start to know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then I can make changes if I choose to make changes. So, so let's go back to that example with the kid moving towards the outlet and let's yeah. let that, that, that'll be metaphorical for my kid's in trouble with drugs or alcohol, yeah. or my kid's getting in trouble at school, or yeah. my child is depressed, my child doesn't have any friends, all those, right, concerns that we have about our kids, yep. you know, in that example, I go get the kid, I have a story in my family where I actually encouraged them <laughs> to go for the outlets, they didn't, but... <laughs> Anyway, well, <laughs> the instinct is to go and get them or help them or whatever. And so, oh, yeah. so the, I mean, and, and I think that's what society says, experts say, you know, if your kid's in trouble, you help them. You, you focus on your kid. This yes. seems to be saying something different. And what does that have to do with a triangle? How would you? Yes, yes, that? yes. I think that this is one of the points that um, conventional therapies are very different from Bowen theory. Um, and that, and that it is, um, less is more <laughs> that, that, which I think we've said before, you know, that, that the understanding triangles would help people understand the acting out behavior again, in whatever way that is acting out for a child. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would include like, you know, chronic illness as well. Not that they're intentionally doing that, but, but that, that would fit into the category of something brews with the kid and mm -hmm. then the parents can just really um, focus and take hold of that issue and put more energy, more focus into that issue, mm -hmm. uh, solving it, um, attending to it, disciplining it, mm -hmm. um, yelling about it, you know, all of that. And less time and energy is being spent on their relationship between the two of them. It's almost mm -hmm. like it all just channels, you know, right to um, this kid and their problem. And I, again, whatever the problem or the difficulty might be, um, and that's why the theory I think is so helpful is because it, it isn't specific to behavior. It isn't specific to physiology or biology. It isn't specific to any of those things. It's across the board mm -hmm. that this thing is happening. And again, really important for people to know this is not intentional. Nobody is wishing you know, difficult, hard times on their family and certainly not on their kids. Yeah. The idea is to understand how this thing, as we said, as we started with, moves around a family. How does it move around the family? How does it move around my family? Mm -hmm. How do I translate this mm -hmm. difficult time with my husband into then, you know, getting, going, really getting into my kids' stuff? Mm -hmm. I don't want to deal with it. Really, what I don't want to do is deal with this difficulty here. And, and I don't know how to, or... Yeah, yeah. I can be not only meddling over here and getting it all super involved here, but I can be encouraged to do that. Schools can encourage you to do that. Yes. The pop culture can encourage you to do that. Uh, 5,000 self-help books can encourage you to do that. They're all going to have ways in which you can do more and you have to do more. You really do. You're the parent and you're responsible. And I would agree with that. You are the parent and you are responsible, but you're responsible, in my opinion, to see the whole picture, to see everything that might be going on in a family. 
not just with one kid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I know this is talked about a lot, oftentimes the death of a grandparent can really transmit through the next generation so that the parent, the child of that parent and show up in a, in a grandchild. Mm -hmm. and, and that's again, that's multiple generational uh, transmission process, which is another issue, uh, another concept in bone theory. But the idea again being that can be the catalyst sometimes mm -hmm. How a parent is managing their parent's death mm -hmm. can very often affect how a child then is managing. So the parent isn't doing very well with their parent having passed away, but they look on the outside like they're handling things pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then, but, but all of a sudden some symptom shows up in this kid. There's something yeah. here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, nobody intends for that to happen, mm -hmm. but it happens nonetheless. It's a process that's so much bigger than we are. It's interesting you say that death of a grandparent. Again, it's not something people tend to think about. We have such a short sighted vision of, yeah. of, of time and of family and of emotional process and that kind of thing. But this happened in our family. Yeah. Oh, um, it did. A grandfather, yeah, a grandfather passed and within a couple of months, um, one of our kids started having panic attacks and, had a pretty dramatic, uh, symptoms. Sure. Um, so, so and, yeah. And that's alarming. You know, this is alarming. I get it. You know, you're kind of all hands on deck thing then. And I totally yeah. understand that. But if I will often say to parents who are struggling with a kid who's really, you know, refusing to go to school, refusing, you know, whatever, really, really big day to day stuff, mm -hmm. you know, parents are having skip work and all kinds of stuff, come home from work, you know, constant calls, kid goes to a behavior disorder in school, you know, the whole, the whole wraparound is, is going and everybody's pretty worked up and anxious, school, mm -hmm. home, extended family. Um, and then, and then kids have a very, if parent, I'll, put, I'll say to parents, you know, what, what are you doing for yourself? You know, where's your stress reduction at? Oh, I mean, I, I haven't been to the gym in three months. I haven't gone to a movie. I haven't gone out to dinner. I haven't, no, I mean, how could I do that? Right. Again, this is, this is an issue every single day. This kid is, we're having an issue. I, I can't, I can't do any of that stuff. That's frivolous. And that's, you know, leisure time. Mm -hmm. And I, while I might agree on some, you know, depending on what you're going to do, but if you're doing absolutely nothing, but focus on this problem in this kid, it is for sure going to exacerbate it. Yeah. And that taking some, some time for yourself and, and, and being able to recharge in some way, have some mm -hmm. hobbies or some interests that, that you can attend to mm -hmm. and, and kind of, get a little involved for a couple hours, it gives you relief, it gives you a break from that intensity toward that kid. Yeah. So yeah. it's better for you, better for the kid. That's right. That's what transmit as well, right? The, the worry that parents have about their kids is kids know they're worried. Kids know their parents are worried, 100%. I've never talked to one kid who's been in a very difficult situation. And when I said to them, how worried do you think your parents are? It's at the top, it's a nine or a 10. Yeah. So they know this is happening, right? Yeah. But kids are not in the leadership position in the family emotionally. They really can't affect too much change. Mm -hmm. it's come, that's why the focus is on the parents. It's got to come from the parent transmit to the kid as well. But that's a, you got to, oh, am, am I frozen? No. Um, yeah, you're a little, it was pretty choppy. I think you're uh, saying uh, kids are not in a leadership position. And so that's why when, as therapists, when we're working with people, we're, we're even if they, they want help with the child, we, we actually really want to work with mom and dad. Right. Because they are in the, they have the potential for leadership in the family. That's right. That's yeah. right. No, no changes are going to be made. It's the trickle down effect. No, no, no work is going to be made from the kid moving up toward the parent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the real work is going to be, um, parents making changes in the way that they're responding to their own anxiety, their own worries, mm -hmm. and their own stress, that is going to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. And so, and so that's um, crucial that parents sort of get a handle on that and mm -hmm. get how stressed out I am and, mm -hmm. and how anxious I am at this, you know, every time the phone rings and it's the school. Uh -huh. you know, it, it, I, I get it. I mean, that's just a very stressful, um, you know, situation. And, mm -hmm. and again, usually only increases a parent's, you know, um, getting worked up about it. Yeah, I got, I have two thoughts, I guess. One is, um, I, you know, that I uh, have a neurofeedback uh, company where I rent systems out to people and it, the, the, it's called whole family neurofeedback because 
it works so much better when mom and dad will will do the tr the brain training themselves. Sure. <laughs> and I, you know, I get the system back from somebody who, you know, mom or dad just didn't have time to do the sessions. It's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. There's only so much that's going to help, right? It doesn't mean it is no yeah. help. I think a right. kid, you know, certainly a teenager coming to talk to me, it's not like it's zero help for them. Sure. It's, it's, a, well, it's another triangle. It's relief. Yes. Yes. But systemically, yeah. if you're looking for real solid lasting change, yeah. in the way that you're interacting, then mm -hmm. the parents have to be the ones to get a handle on themselves. Yeah. And then yeah, one them. parent. Yeah. Yeah. One, yeah, parent's one parent. And that, that can be hard. Um, you know, people think we have to do this together and whatever. Um, and that's a hard one to get over emotionally. If it's just one of you, who's going to get, start investing in, in yourself. Right. And right. The, the second thought I, I had, there was, um, there's an author, Hal Runkel. Yes. He, he, oh, do you know the Scream Free Parenting? Yeah. So he yeah. wrote a book called Scream Free Parenting. He does uh, uh, study Bowen theory and he sort of has written it in a way that's very accessible to people. Yeah. He didn't talk about triangles. <laughs> yeah. but, right. but he says, you know, a pretty core principle of a triangle is, is how am I as a self? But the way he puts it is, uh, the most loving thing you can do for your kids is to put yourself first. Right. Um, and that's just so counter uh, to, yeah. you know, how much pressure there is, not just from society, right, right, but from your mother-in-law or yeah. from yeah. your mom or your dad or your grandma, whatever. There's so much pressure to put those kids first. Well, what are you doing about Tom's, Tommy's uh, ADHD? Or, right. you know, what, you know, um, How's Tommy doing? And not that those things can't be discussed, right? Because, sure. because you know, people need to be kept, kept in the loop. They need to kind of like, mm -hmm. but the, if that's all you're talking about with your parents, if that's all you're talking about with your siblings, if that's all you're talking about with your neighbors, then you have an idea that you are consumed with this worry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's not to say that kids don't kick up a lot of dust. I mean, kids can be suicidal. Kids can be on the verge of really harming themselves. So I'm not at all uh, negating the fact that this can be very, very serious. Yeah. But, but it's still the same idea that if you, um, the analogy I like to use, again, very simple. When you're on an airplane, what they tell you to do is if those oxygen masks come down, you put yours on first and then you assist your child. Right. It's the same concept, of course, more complicated because the human life and the human brain and, and is very complicated. So it's more complicated than that, but the very same idea. We have the to resist the idea. instinct, the, the instinctive urge to, to help or, or fix or whatever. Um, we have to resist that, I, I think, for, for long term. And, and that, that's tough. Yeah. And we, you and I were discussing earlier this idea that this can often be um, coined as being selfish. Mm -hmm. That a parent who is spending a lot of time or start shifting away from so much focus on a kid yeah. um, and making time for themselves, making time for them to do things they enjoy with the family and without the family. Mm -hmm. um, that that can be deemed as, you know, you're being selfish because you go to art class every Tuesday night or you go to, you know, tennis on, you know, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or you whatever. You, you have a, a day out or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, that that can be deemed as, as being selfish, selfish. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea, and Mike Kerr is, is I think, coined this, how, do you, how can you be for self yes. and not be selfish? Because that isn't the idea. It's, it isn't about being selfish. It is about being, if mm -hmm. I don't recharge, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to be of no use to this kid if I don't. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes when we are physically exhausted, that's one thing, like when you have a baby, right, and you're new, new to, mo to mothering or um, parenting, you know, it's just physically exhausting. So you absolutely have to say to someone, take this baby, I got to take a nap, right? That's the, like, that's at the breaking point, right? I, I physically cannot stand up any longer. Yeah. And what we're talking about, I mean, that's one piece of it, but what we're talking about more is kind of like the head stuff, right? So it's not that you're physically so exhausted, although you might be. Because yeah. you might be, your sleep must, might be really messed up, but it's more about kind of the emotional piece that's happening and that energy that's being sucked out um, mm -hmm. uh, of the self for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, again, very nuanced, right, in the ways that we're thinking about this. But it isn't about 
I'm doing this for me and for no one else. It is that I'm doing this for me because I'm at my wit's end and I can't think straight. I can't even keep my thoughts in my head clear and reasonable and fact-based. I'm all over the place with worry. Yeah. And and the anxiety is, you know, just as high as I can handle it. And then taking a break and taking the nap, essentially, Mm -hmm. it's the same idea. But I think that it gets, it can get, um, coded in, you know, well, well, you don't care anything about this kid or Mm -hmm. a a kid can even say that you don't, you don't care about me because you're going to do this thing or you're going to, you know, read your book and not pay attention to me. You know, a kid can even kind of pull you into that. Again, they don't know what they're doing, Mm -hmm. but a parent has to be the one to be able to step back and go, no, that's not what I'm doing. You know, Mm -hmm. be confident in the fact that I'm taking restorative measures for me because I'm paying attention to where my stress level is at. Yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's the guidepost in the storm, <clears throat> right? There aren't any easy answers with parenting, but there are these guideposts that, you know, if you get in a situation where your kid's in trouble or yeah. anxious or hurting or whatever, the guidepost is if I go in and try to help um, in the way that I have been, I know I'm going to make it worse. So I'm going to sit tight and I'm going to trust that this kid can work it out. And I'm going to find a way to communicate that to this kid by holding on to my worry, by however I'm going to do it. Even asking them, what are you going to do about that? Yeah. You know, know, whatever. Having that guidepost, you know, that doesn't mean that they're suddenly going to say, well, mother, what I'm going to do about my anxiety is I'm going to learn to meditate and I'm going to exercise. Right? That doesn't (laughs) happen. That's why you use guideposts. It's so important. It's like to be grounded in. I know I can really contribute to the intensity of this and that that intensity by by trying to help and that that intensity will uh, not be helpful ultimately. And just remembering that and staying grounded in, I got to take care of myself. Um, Right. Because it isn't about distancing, right? It is about still staying present. Yes. Um, so taking time for yourself isn't about like, I'm checking out right. in that way, yeah. emotionally in that way. It is, I'm checking out for a few hours to go do something and then I'll be right back. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so like, Hey, hang on to that thought. I'll be back in a few hours and we can pick up that kind of idea. Yeah. Right? I'm not ignoring your distress. I just can't attend to it right now. I have to go to work or I have to, you know, I have things I have to do. Mm-hmm. And I will be back and we will talk to you about it. So I think that's maintaining the presence, maintaining um, attention to the issue without constant focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and here again, this is not to say in emergencies, we don't drop everything because we do, we do do that and that's right. appropriate. Right. So this, this theory isn't across the board. We all do the same thing. That's why it's not based in techniques and it's based in theory because each of us takes the theory and then thinks through it for ourselves what does that mean? In this situation, I do have to stay. I have to cancel these plans and stay because this is, this is different. Mm-hmm. And in this situation, mm-hmm. I, I'm going to go ahead. It's going to be a little uncomfortable for you, but I'm going to go ahead. So there's, it's not about a rigid plan. It is about flexibility and being able as the parent to think through it for yourself mm-hmm. because one day it may be that you handle it this way and the next day you handle it a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we got to start to wrap up today. Yeah. Let's recap on triangles a little bit, I guess, is I don't know if it's when we're talking about working, working on self or, or taking this moment, these moments for yourself, thinking for yourself and all that, that is a way to work a triangle. Another little bit of lingo there, right? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? What does all this have to do with triangles? What does working a triangle mean in, in this? Language? Yeah, working a triangle is essentially, again, if I make this as simple as I can, working the triangle is trying to stay in contact with the two, with the two other people in the triangle. So, so if, if it's me and this other person, I try to keep things just between me and that other person. Okay. Uh, so so I, if I have an issue and we've had a conflict or a distance, I hold on to that, manage myself and my anxiety until I'm ready to address it with this person. Mm-hmm. And I resist as best I can going to that third party. Um, and this, isn't, this is not an all or nothing. You do it. It's okay. No, no one's going to, you know. But it's so hard. 
Yeah, it is very hard. But but the idea being in your head, okay, I gotta I gotta work through this in my own thoughts and then address it with them. And and until I can do that, I just kind of hold steady and try to tread water, so to speak, with the tension. If you're the third party being trangled in mm -hmm. that that this person's coming to you about this person, then the idea would be I have to stay in contact. Well, you don't have to, but the idea being I will stay in contact with this person and I will stay in contact with this person, mm -hmm. but only about each of them. So when this person comes to me to talk about this third person, I restrict myself in only discussing them and me. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if they were to say something like, oh, Jim said, blah, blah, blah. I can't believe he said that. I was so furious and I just, can you believe he said that to this person? Mm -hmm. And then this person would respond something like, if they, were, if they understood triangles, they would respond something like, wow, that sounds like you're very upset about that. You sound really angry. Because what I'm doing is I'm only addressing this person. I'm not joining you and, and dissing this person. Mm -hmm. And I'm also not defending them and saying, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure he didn't mean that. That's mm -hmm. not what he meant. He's a super nice guy. That's uh -huh. not what he meant. You know, so you don't, you don't join the person that's coming mm -hmm. to you and you don't defend the other person. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, are the two real keys to, to working it if you're if you're the one getting triangled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does, that, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, it makes me think of uh, like if my daughters complain to me about my husband, their father. <laughs> you know, uh, um, what seems to have worked better for me is, is doing more of, you know what, you and Papa can figure this out. Yes, um, exactly. Wow, that sounds really tough. I, you guys are gonna, you got a pickle. You, you know, you guys, Yeah. that's a tough one. You know, that kind of stuff. You're just open-ended statements, you're not joining them. Right. You're not ignoring them and saying, yeah. no, 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 don't talk to me about that. You're, you're addressing them, mm -hmm. but you're leaving this person for them to deal with. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And again, it's not like you get some big satisfying, you know, relief or resolution at that moment because it's not yours to resolve. It's theirs. That's um, right. That's there right. is some relief and in, in not being in the middle for sure. <laughs> sure. But if you're, if you're, your kids and your spouse are distressed or having difficulty with one another. It's not an easy thing. That's mm -hmm. unpleasant. You, you know, your, your care and concern is for both of them, right? So this is not, again, this is going to jack up my anxiety because mm -hmm. I know that these two people are having a hard time with one another. So it's not like I'm completely, you know, out of it. I'm trying my hardest to stay out of it as best I can. Yes. But to think that that would have no impact on me is sort mm -hmm. of, I think, naive. Mm -hmm. um, understanding body language and you know all yeah. the vibes that go on um, that don't have to be spoken words um, that we we transmit oh. and pass along and I think because well we're talking about triangles and through the recording today we've talked about um, the multi-generational piece so it is very upsetting and then I can get really mad at him for what he's doing with them like really mad what helps me there is working on the triangle with my parents, right? The oh. most unpopular idea in counseling, right? Is <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta be in a relationship with your parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But that, you know, I've been at this for 21 years, <laughs> probably longer, uh, definitely longer. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I've tried, <clears throat> I've tried it all. And that's, that's something that really brings perspective and, yeah. Um, and maybe, maybe that's what we talk about in our next recording <laughs> sure. is what does some of that family work look like, um, when you're, you know, having a different relationship with your parents. I don't know. We, we yeah. haven't talked about that, but yeah. maybe yeah, that would be a good one. Cause that's really important that this, yeah. again, not just a focus and a, you know, a, a myopic view of, of yeah. one particular family. It relieves my anxiety with my husband. It helps me see him more clearly. It helps me see my own reactions more clearly of why I'm so ups I get so upset with him and um and and going back further generations is even more helpful yes. to, you know, to sort yes. of begin to get this broader perspective that's right I don't think we can survive parenting without it I mean it's just it'd be it'd be really tough without being able yeah. to get back and try to get some perspective definitely it's tough life is tough and it's tough for everybody and there's lots of things coming at all of us a lot yeah. most of the time so life is, life is tough and parenting is tougher yeah, yeah. <laughs> trying to grow little little people is hard stuff yes <laughs> all right well thank you for today kelly and uh we'll look thank forward to the, to the next recording thank you all right bye